Welcome everybody. We'll start this webinar in a few minutes. All right, everyone, welcome to our second webinar in the series. This one's with uh, Luciana Herrera. We'll be talking about animation. This is for our uh, Cartoon Crunch event that's gonna start next week. So check those dates, the information's on our website. I'm your host, my name is Tom Feston. And I'll be uh, directing questions towards uh, Luciana during the during the webinar. So please put those questions in the chat or in the in the Q and A. Uh, so we've got a one hour session, and we'll be posting this up on YouTube as soon as uh, this evening. So without further ado, it's all yours. All right. Let's see. Ooh, first time on camera like this. Uh, so hi, so my name is Luciano Herrera, uh, a little bit about myself. I'm currently working on, as a designer on Moon Girl Devil Dinosaur for Disney. Um, it's been quite a journey. Uh, I've been doing this for a little while now. I've been very fortunate to be able to jump around uh, several studios. Um, and as the work has influenced um, a lot of the ways I think about art. I wanna share some of that stuff with you all. And uh, let's get started. So let me share my screen real quick. So one of the first things I wanted to talk about was some of the influences that I had growing up uh, I'm a child of the 80s, so a lot of the things that influenced me, and I grew up in uh, South America, I grew up in Argentina, so a lot of the things that influenced me were the 80s cartoons, the Saturday morning cartoons were super important, uh, even more than the movies, I will say. Um, some of the shows that I would watch uh, will also be live action shows, uh, El Chavo del Ocho, if you're uh, Spanish speaking, you know that that is everything to us. Um, the comedy, the relationships between characters, um, it, it, it's almost a live action cartoon. Uh, Get Smart was really another great influence. You can see it all over Inspector Gadget and many, many other shows. Of course, Thundercats, Dragon Ball Z, Silverhawks, Mazinga Z, and Cobra were just to name a few. And a lot of the things that I saw in that era was adventure and uh, solving problems. And it's all about relationships with characters. Hey, Luciana? Yes, go ahead. Are you screen sharing? Yes. Oh, we can't see it. There we go. Thank you. Awesome. Can we see that now? Yeah. Oof. Thank you for your help. Um, so, as you can see, some of these shows, um, Get Smart, as I was saying, El Chavo del Ocho, Cobra, um, Dragon Ball Z, Silverhawks, Thundercats, Mazinga Z. Yeah, there were great influences on the ways that I see cartoons. So the big one, of course, to me, was He-Man. And um, the, the thing that I started to look at as an adult was that the cartoon itself has a way of making you feel a certain way through the designs and the backgrounds. It's a very dark, actually, cartoon. And there's a lot of like things that you will think um, are not appropriate for kids, or maybe they're trusting kids to understand what's going on. 
So there's a lot of like monsters and it's, it's very dark and it's very much of its era. Um, same with the, when, when you start breaking down the layouts and stuff, um, you can see the limitations that they had at the time with the medium and what they were trying to do. Um, but it's a well-designed show for what it was doing. So one of the things that I really want to talk about is story and how everything starts with a script. And most of the time, our designs, what you have to always keep in mind is design should always serve the story. And your job is to not outshine the characters of the story, but to set them up and to allow this world to exist and fill it up with things to support, if not make the, the storytelling better. So what is important is the story. And that's something that you'll hear over and over again. So, one of the shows that I worked on for quite a while was uh, DuckTales. And this is the main image that the art director put together for the executives to move forward. And this is the, this is the image that pretty much got the show, um, not me, but it was the, the main image that everybody agreed on that it should be what DuckTales should look like moving forward. And if you look at this image, there's a lot of simplification and a lot of design and a lot of choices to highlight the story. There's a first read and then there's a second read. The first thing that your eye does is go to the main action where the family is in the Land Rover. And as you move your eyes around in the composition, you see more of their landscape and these Indians or natives that are trying to attack them. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image that is doing so many things at once. It's simplifying everything to just tell the story. And it doesn't get in the way of the action. So it's a very, very strong setup. So when I was on DuckTales, I got to do some of the designs uh, and this is again we were reading the script breaking it down and um, the team was breaking it down and at that time um, they were assigned off different different designs or different backgrounds they needed to support what the story was saying so this is like uh, the first pass at this at this specific story so in this, in this episode, what they had was the DuckTales gang was going to Valhalla and in Valhalla, the way that they settled their arguments or their conflict was by having a wrestling match a la WWF or WWE. I'm a child of the 80s, so Macho Man, Hulk Hogan and all that stuff, it's right up there for me. So this, was trying to show what the space would be like and what it would do and how how it would be lit, how it's designed. So if we look at specifically we we're we're moving towards the center and the ring has to be everything on this specific design. And everything is supporting and moving your eye towards that ring. And then it allows you to move around and look at what else is going on and that's when you start to fill up all those little details and um, but the highest contrast if you can see is in the middle which is the highest value uh, black and the highest white and that focus the audience exactly where you want it to go then we move from there to a little bit of a more like atmospheric type of visual development piece where we can explore a little bit more of the mood and what it should feel. Again, what does it make you feel? It's a, something that is that it's very much in my mind a lot when we're doing the work. 
Um, this is another piece, and this is more to illustrate path of action and where we're going and what the background is doing. This is not necessarily an exercise on design itself on this specific image, but it's more to serve what the characters are doing and where we're going. So in this, let's see. So this background is designed to cover what we call feels. And the background will, we will kind of start around here, we will move in this direction and we will have the vehicle moving this way and all the way around right where the airplane is and then it will load up to the airplane. So we're doing a lot of things in this particular background. So the vehicle starts at a certain size and as it goes through we have this foreground element that will parallax in front of the the vehicle to create the sense of depth and then it will move and it will shrink and it will be much smaller to create that illusion that we're not just moving in a horizontal line but we're also moving in space so that illustrates what we we'll talk about with staging and allowing the background to support the story and the action. Uh, this is another background from DuckTales. In this particular background, we will not have any of the characters interact with the background or any element. It was just the background where we will look outside the window of a train and everything will be parallaxing and moving. So how do we set up so this is the first image that we see when we go to the west. So this was a way to set up the actual landscape, almost as a character itself. It has its own personality and moves its own, its own way in how we create this sense of vastness in a 2D show. Um, and creating this monolithic shapes as well um, helps to understand how big things are by putting little items like the cactus on the trees and putting the cactus up front to give you an idea as well in the foreground, to give you an idea as well of how this specific background, what the size of things are. It allows you to also show that this, and this guy, it's about, it's the same size as this guy, but we can tell how far they are. Also creating these foreground elements to create, being right in the foreground, middle ground elements. And then again, our backgrounds really far in the distance and pushing the background way far by making it lighter and getting rid of lines. So as you can see, the lines are here, but they're a lot more dominant here. But as we move way back, we, we lose the line altogether. So it just becomes about shapes. This is another background that was done for the moon episode. And one of the biggest things that I want to convey and have a feeling of it's big, it's, it's rough, and it's Looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Oh yeah, we have to wait for him to log back in. Looks like he lost his internet connection, so hold tight.
Looks like we're still working on getting Luciano reconnected. So please hold tight. Should only take a few minutes. Welcome back. Everything okay? Hey, Tom. The power went out in my neighborhood. Oh, wow. Yeah, so <laughs> I luckily came back up and uh, I was able to turn on the computer again. Okay. So that's the first time I have ever had that in a meeting. Um, yeah, that's the first time for us, too. Oh. Glad to see you come back. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was like, what? Out of all the times, so all the days. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that's anyway, our luck. That's okay. 2020. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, this year it's been incredible. Yeah. the The only suggestion from before you got cut off was zoom in on those images a little bit more so people can see more detail. You got but it. Other than that, you're good to go. It's all yours. All right. Thank you. And I apologize for that, everybody. So let's see. Let's go back. So here we go. So this is the last image we were looking at. Okay, so let's keep going. <sighs> Sorry about that, everybody. So here we, we were talking about the moon and how the moon, I wanted it to be its own character in, uh, 
um, I really liked the, the, the film Lawrence of Arabia and I like how the desert, it's its own character. And there's a lot of quiet moments in this episode. So um, having this moments of her, the character looking out into the moon and how it all feels just so vast and empty. Um, it was all, it was something important to me in this specific episode. Um, another thing that got to do on that episode was to design the interior of the ships and what things would do and how they would move and the shape language for this alien race. So by using the shapes of the helmets and their um, outfits, how do we replicate that in the, in the language of their design to show that they belong in that ship, they belong in that place. Um, then another show that I got to work on was Green Eggs and Ham. I'm, I'm, I apologize that this image is so blown out and the colors, it's a lot off, but uh, I'm trying to illustrate that again, this is a completely different way of designing and how to think about storytelling. In this show, one of the things that the creators were really looking into was how does if how do how can you make it feel like Dr. Zeus, but not feel like it's made out of candy or fluffy or like made out of clouds. So one of the things that they were doing in the show was to use one shape or one line and exaggerate that one and then keep everything else pretty much like if it existed in the real world. So by exaggerating roof lines, exaggerating perhaps the trunk of a tree, but not all the branches, it starts to create a shape language, but it also it creates that in the storytelling that there is, it's a world, but it's solid. And there is, you know, there's consequences to what you do. So, this was a very fun project. Um, I had to, I had a lot of help in this and um, I was very lucky to be working with a very, very talented artist that helped me a lot. And I learned from their sensitivities of design. Again, as we can see into, in these compositions, um, everything leads the eye to where the characters are gonna be everything's framing again the storytelling um this one i really like the flow that was achieved in these backgrounds and again you know exactly where to look well i hope you do and um and it leads the eye in a in a movement towards where we want the camera to move, where we want the characters to be. And it, it creates, it's already helping the action of what the animation is gonna be doing. Um, this is another set, but this is more to show the overseas studios, what the space and what everything is and how it's designed and how to make sense of things. And this is not necessarily a background to show where the characters are going to be, but it's more to illustrate how things are placed in this in the space and how busy it should feel, and again, how it's a feel. So in this background, you can see the path of action of the characters and how in that area you you don't need to fill it up with elements or with stuff it's just it's it's just again the background should support what the characters are doing and where they're going so let's see this is more of a line drawing so you guys get to see uh, a clean layout before it goes to paint and a lot of the a lot of the design solutions are already in the layout and it allows the painters to think about lighting and atmosphere and mood Again, most of these shapes, as you can see, they're pretty solid. There's like 
a little bit of wonky, but there's, it's not too much. Um, the wonky is just there to show the world. But for example, in this specific background, one of the things that the art director was emphasizing was this should feel like it's moving. But everything else, if you look at it, it's pretty rooted in perspective. There might be just a little bit of changes and flows, but it all works in perspective. Again, there are certain rules like the rule of thirds and the golden ratio. And all those, all those tools are to make your, your, your drawing stronger, but it, they should not rule your drawing. There's also, it should feel right. Um, if the drawing doesn't feel right, there's something missing in your design. So, um, again, movement and flow. Where do we enter? Where do we enter the scene? Where do we leave? Creating that flow. Just everything leading the eye to where we want it to go. Uh, allowing the design to do its job. Let's see. Um, here, you can see there's so much busyness and there's so much going on and everything, but allowing spaces to be, to have breathing room and be empty sometimes, it allows for the staging and it allows for the design to be stronger. Um, it is a very busy, background, but everything's thought out, even though it looks just kind of loose, um, it's thought out, it, 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 everything is kind of rooted in perspective and then it moves away from it. Um, let's see. I've got a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. So how do you design the scene as if it were 3D? What software are you using to create these images? I only use Photoshop. Um, I, I this is all Photoshop. That's incredible. Yeah, this is all Photoshop. Um, I don't use uh, 3D very much. Um, the only thing I might use sometimes just to uh, help with the perspective or if I have to plot something quick. I might use SketchUp for shapes and to create a space. And then I move the camera around, but it's just shapes. It's not really, it's not really the, the full background. I just create shapes. And in that way, I, I move the camera around to find a, a place that is, it serves the story and it creates a composition that is actually working to what we're trying to say. And then uh, I put it away. It, 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 I don't. So the, the thing with 2D is that everything in perspective and everything crafted perfectly in perspective, it does not work all the time. Um, you are not, you're imitating reality, but you're not copying reality. So one of the main things that you should keep in mind is Composition is always should should come on top of craftsmanship in the sense of perspective. Um, using so, uh, so I don't like when people don't use perspective at all, uh, and they it's they they fall under the assumption that it's my style. It's my I I think perspective should be used in these. And I say perspective as one of the examples of the many tools that there are in illustration. But I think you can put it away once you master it and you can make those decisions um, because you have mastered it and you understand it. Um, but again, it's also, you should not fall slave to or you know, be 
dictated always by perspective. Uh, especially with 2D, there's so much that you can do with just um, composition and what you, and, and, and we do cheat a little bit here and there to create a more pleasing image. This is, this one is not mine. I think this one is from Jason Norton that we were together on remixing him. Uh, but this is another way to illustrate, you know, perspective, but then putting it away and pushing the shapes a little bit more, but it feels solid and it feels like it's moving into space. And um, is is just having that balance between design and what it could do. Same with this, um, also the power of design and, and lighting and staging. And, you know, it might, be beating you over the head of where you want him to look, but it works. You know, it's um, the, 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 the very strong lighting on that specific, you know, cheese store makes you want to go there. So, uh, you know, they're, they're simple tools, but if they work, they work. Um, this is another, uh, again, this was, you were asking about 3D, I did plot out the space in 3D to have a better idea where I want the camera to go. And then you put it away and then you start pushing the shapes and pushing everything where it is. And it looks more 3D than my drawing was because of the talent of the painters and how they use lighting um, to communicate, you know, sense of death in, in the atmosphere of that specific background. Here again, you know, using the shapes, using perspective, using atmosphere. Um, for example, that cityscape, I wish I would have done it in 3D, I guess, but I don't think I would have gotten the same feel for it if I, if I would have used 3D. Um, it's also allowing the drawing. Sometimes you start a drawing and you might get into, getting into like really doodling very tight and small. And, and I, I, I tend to do that. So what I do is I step back from the drawing and then I'll let the drawing dictate a little bit what it wants to be, allowing myself to see the drawing for what it is. Um, here's another design. And again, um, trying to make it feel dimensional uh, and there's no 3D here. Um, it's just understanding the space and what it does and understanding through composition and through craftsmanship what you can do and create in a space where this conductor can be driving his train and put in randomly uh, a water cooler there so they can, I don't know, I thought it would be funny. Um, yeah, and little elements. Um, and it's busy, but it's not, um, it, it's, it's supposed to be busy, but it's not as busy as you might think. Um, every, when you look up close, you, you can kind of tell what everything is. Um, and that, I like that a lot in my designs because I like simplicity and I like the drawing to not get too complicated so you're not not hiding bef behind complexity when a drawing should be working if you if you make a drawing and then you strip everything and you start stripping away things until the drawing doesn't work anymore i think that's more powerful by having a, a very strong design um and this one was um you know the design that we did for the swamp as well. So, but again, staging and flow. So another particular thing that I was kind of bringing up was how we, I use a lot of references on my work, but it's not about copying the reference. It's about using the reference to influence what you're trying to do. Um, we are trying, we're designing what we see from nature, but we're not copying nature. Nature is a wonderful designer, 
but then what we're trying to do is interpret that and create a pleasing shapes and ways of interpreting and seeing the world. Um, so for example, like, let's see, maybe if we draw a little something to illustrate. So let's see, okay. So we can have some sort of like string. We want to create a sense of movement. And by creating, using the line to tell how big the shapes are and what they're supposed to go. It can create an idea of where you want the audience to look at and see. So putting shapes in front of each other, but always varying, making varying the shapes and creating a sense of boom movement always having a sense of where we want the audience to see so like if we were to cut let's say we were to cut this a little bit let's make it We want it to go. And this is something from the lesson of one of my instructors in school, where he was showing us how to create movement in a composition. And just allowing the shapes to leave the eye where we want it to go. So always thinking even though we have a flat image. And it's three dimensional way. So like if it was a hill, you know, there's like some movement to that hill. So then how do we place so the footprint of a rock, for example, and then how its shape would interact with that specific spot. And then by allowing that to do that, it allows you to put shapes one on top of the other, but it starts to give you a sense of what the planes are. I've got another question for you. Okay. So when you're designing a background like this, what's the most important aspect of this background? What's the most important part? Right now, I'm trying to, for example, I'm trying to figure out a way to 
have the audience move and let's see in this direction in the background and things should be supporting that by us moving things this way um, if you see the lines that I'm using are and this is just a rough and this is just to get ideas down and how things could be moving and, and shapes and what's what but again always keeping in mind where you want your audience to look um, and then stylistic you know what shapes are and what you want them to be how do you want them to convey what you're trying to say so this is one way of doing it which is just line and you just kind of flow of consciousness and then you're thinking about shapes and design and what you want this hill to do to look like um, if you have more questions, please shoot as so I'm doing this because I'm trying to, sometimes I get quiet when I'm drawing. What dictates your color palette for these backgrounds? Oh, um, well, what we're, first of all, like what we're trying to say, uh, the, the place, uh, uh, what time of the day it is, what's the action that's gonna happen in that place. Um, because uh, the same background can be painted in many different ways, depending on what you're trying to say and what's the mood and um, again, to support the story. Um, but once it's a background is well designed, color is another element that supports your design. We've got one of our cartoon crunchers in here, Ken called us. He wow. says, your, your backgrounds are so beautiful that they work alone without characters, but in a show, a character is usually the focus. So what can you do to create backgrounds that won't steal the attention away from the characters in it? Uh, staging, uh, creating um, where the characters are, it should be the place that there's the least amount of information. Um, just to create a sense of staging and a sense of, and thank you for the compliment. Uh, I'm glad you liked it, the backgrounds. Um, uh, it, it, it just keeping in mind where your characters are gonna be. And then you can, you can flex, I guess you would say, in other areas to just try to, um, to showcase a little bit of a, the under, like what is that place? Where are they? Like, what's the what's the adventure gonna be? How are we supposed to feel? Is it is it a menacing place? Is it like is it a mansion? You know, with ghosts and and all that stuff. You don't necessarily have to put horrifying things everywhere. Just put little things that maybe don't don't read in the first the first time you look at the background. You see them in the second time, and um, yeah, and allowing the characters to explore the space and to find the, find those little moments with you. Um, so, but uh, so for example, this is kind of a rough, uh, I, I have never done a demo, so um, I'm not used to drawing and talking at the same time. So I hope this is not too crazy, but um, so let's say, so here's, a rough where we have some shapes. So now if I want to go further back, I might do some really far back stuff that is just shape driven and we lose the line altogether. Oh, wow. Let's 
When you design, do you do a lot of reference thumbnails or do you just go at it like this? Uh, I, so I like to understand the place. So I do a lot of, um, so I'll put pictures up, but not too many. I try to, I try to focus on two to three images that are very strong to show me what the place is like. And then from there, um, I try to have one to two images as well of some sort of design or some sort of drawing that I like that shows me a little bit more of what are my stylistic choices. And then I move from there. And then I put them up and I leave them in the back, but I don't allow, I, I, I let them influence the drawing, but then there's that specific moment when you have to put them away. And then you come back and you look at them again, and then you put them away again. And going with that back and forward, because you also want a little bit of your voice to come through in the drawing. So let's see. You say you use Photoshop almost exclusively. Do you use any real specific brushes or just all the default stuff? That's a good question. Um, so for different shows, I might make my own brushes. So for example, right now for Moon Girl, we we're trying to figure out a way to specifically simplify the way that we do trees and foliage and all that stuff. So what I kept doing was I looked at <clears throat> real references or I will draw a, a, like, I will get a, a leaf or something and then I will draw it and then I will see how it plays in the, in, in the as a flat image. And then I will create my own brushes. Um, I like creating my own brushes and it's not, it's not a bad idea to use some brushes, but um, especially if you're a, a beginner, feel out what people are doing with brushes. Make sure, uh, like, um, but have an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing with the brushes. And it's, it's, a, it's a quick tool to fill up space too, but brushes will not make your design. Like you have to, you have to work at it and then the brushes will, will make your workflow quicker or um, they will help you. For example, like I don't like drawing a whole tree sometimes, but the shapes of the tree, it's what I'm, I'm most focused on. So actually, that's a very good point. Let's, let me do a tree really quick and I'll show you what I do with the, with the brushes. To kind of influence that. One second. I hope I answered that question. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, actually, certain shows when you start working for them, or when they give you an assignment, or you're doing freelance, or even a test they will send you a pack with the specific brushes that they use on that show because um, it, it gives you the ability to match the line quality and the, the way that they, you know, uh, there, there's line weight specifically for show, it's very line heavy um, and it allows you to do that. Let's see, let's get a little bit of shapes in here. Okay. When you're given a scene to draw in one of these shows, do you draw the character first or the background? I do uh, like a placeholder 
and I put in the, the, the characters where they're going to be. I am very fortunate to work in shows that they have amazing character designers. And so I use their characters, but I use their silhouettes and their shapes to kind of dictate where they're going to be and what they're going to be doing because um, I am mainly focused on staging and what the background is doing is in support of those characters. Um, but I usually do not design the characters for these scenes. Uh, I have done that for other projects and I like to work with the silhouette of the character and where they're gonna go. And then we put the character in. But if I'm doing character design, it's a completely separate exercise. That's pretty cool. And you're just pulling this scene from memory or? This? You're just doodling? I'm just doodling, man. That's awesome. It's just, um, I don't know. It's just what I felt like going right now. Um, sometimes the mind does that. And it's a good exercise to like, sometimes draw or whatever. Um, that kind of leads to the next question. Uh, what tips do you have to better perfect the different types of perspectives that you have to draw for a scene? Mileage. Um, and that means practice, 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 practice. Like the, the way that you Looks like we may have run into some more difficulties. Yeah, we've lost him again. So please be patient as we bring him back.
Right. Welcome okay. back. Yeah. Do you think your power is going to be stable enough for the rest of this, or do you want to try this again uh, at a later date? Let's just keep going. I Let's don't keep know going what's then. Going on. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I apologize to everybody. It's no, no. Stuff uh, happens. Yeah, man. Um, so go ahead. Keep asking questions. So we'll keep working. Yeah, let me stop my screen share. All right. It's all yours. Thank you. Um, sorry about that again, guys. No, it's everyone was being patient, so no worries. Uh, yeah, this this year's been a lot to, <laughs> to navigate. So you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, we all we all can be a little bit patient with each other. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but anyways, um, so what were we at, question wise? I don't remember. Um, so I think about trees and brushes. And yeah, yeah, it was brushes. Okay, so uh, well, since we're talking about brushes, this little this little, little tree. Uh, happy little tree. Happy little tree. I just listened for the first time on NPR about his life story. Um, Bob yeah, Ross. it's pretty incredible. He was in the military. He was a drill sergeant. Yeah. And he made a promise to himself that he would never yell again. And then he started a little show. And it's amazing. It kind of shows you that you can change your life at any point. Um, and I can relate to that a lot. I didn't go to art school in, or decide to do this until I was 29. Oh, wow. So how'd you get your start in the industry? So <laughs> funny story. So it goes like this, talking about a different career path. Uh, I was a bank manager for Wells Fargo for many years. And one day I was walking into work and I saw myself on the glass door. And I didn't remember what day it was because every day started to feel the same way. And I decided to quit that day and I quit and I started to research what would be the birds art school or options to do that. And I went to that art school and I talked to them and I asked, what do I need to do to come here? And they said, you need a portfolio. Okay. So I went to my local community college and I took all the live drawing classes and I put a portfolio, uh, portfolio together. And I went back to the same office and I talked to them and they were like, oh, welcome back. And I got in and I've been working at it pretty much every day since then because in my mind is the guys that are working in the industry are drawing every day they're getting better every day and i need to catch up so i draw every day and i do exercises every day of things that i am not comfortable with and they might not be something that i do and they're not for work for me and um it's just a way to keep moving forward um uh, when i finished art school i needed to get a job so i went to a studio close by and i figured out i don't recommend you guys do this i figured out when it was their lunch hour and i walked in like i worked there and i went to the hr department and I told them that I wanted a job. And they, first they asked me who I was and if they needed to call security. And then they gave me an assistant job. And two weeks later, I was working for them. So it's a lot about how much you want it, how much you want to do this. 
and failing and not failing at moving forward. Like keep moving forward. And you're gonna have 20 no's before you get a yes or even more. But all you're looking for is the yes. You don't care about the no's. The no, everybody will tell you now. Everybody went out when, when it's 29, I'm like, I'm gonna do art. No, I didn't do that, man. No, um, yes, yes I am. And now I'm doing this and I'm here with you guys. So. Looks like you're pretty good at it too. <laughs> well, thanks, man. Yeah. Um, thank you. I hope so. Yeah, um, it looks good. I, I try hard. So do you have any books that you'd recommend? Any uh, educational materials for the attendees to help them uh, get better at this? Sure. Um, you know, this is an unbelievable time when you have access to all the best artists in the world at want, and everybody's at home <laughs> and everybody's doing tutorials and stuff like that. So when I went to school, you did not have YouTube videos of, well, you did, but it wasn't to this level now where everybody's doing it. So you are able to follow or to get little bits and pieces of people's process and ways of doing things. And I think it's unbelievable what you can learn on YouTube and uh, on you know sites like this one where you can just spend the time and ask questions and always ask questions. Don't ever feel like, uh, you know, like, oh, that's a dumb question. No, 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 no. Chances are that people have the same question in the room and they just think the same way. Oh, it's a dumb question. I don't want to ask or I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to feel that I know, I don't, I don't want them to know that I don't know that. Listen, I, 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 I struggle with English all the time <laughs> and I sometimes to my wife, I'm like, I don't know what that means because I didn't grow up here. So sometimes she will be like telling me about a show or, or a movie or I say a word wrong and she's, and I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know. So being embarrassed is okay. Doing something about it and asking questions is even better. So some of the books I will recommend are just the classics. Um, so for example, the Disney layout, Disney layout and backgrounds, uh, from the Walt Disney animation studios is really good. Um, any, anything that, you know, will move you forward, um, and, and just following artists that you really like and, and, and maybe asking them questions. Hey man, you know, like, I really love how you did that there. And, 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 and allowing them, I, most, most artists actually want to share and want everybody to do better, um, you know? So, yeah, so uh, I got caught up on this. Let's do a little tree, let's see. So when I think of trees, I think of shapes. And what shape is that tree gonna occupy in the space? So, so it's gonna be like that, like that. And it's, it's three dimensional in how this tree is growing in its own way, you know. And then yeah, it's a circle. And this, this is very stylized since we're just drawing off the top of my head. And understanding the, the shape and where things are going. But I will say practice, practice, practice every day. Just like music. 
How long does this process usually take from start to finish? Uh, for uh, background? Yeah, especially with all the input from the directors and the other artists too. Again, it depends on the project and depends on how, what, what point of the project you're on. Uh, at the beginning of a show, a lot of times, because it's TV, it's not like film, um, you're figuring things out as you are in production. So here we are talking about brushes. Um, let's see. So here I have this is pretty nice um, foliage brush. Maybe we can use that one. But uh, what was I saying? So yeah, it depends on, on the project and it depends on the, how far uh, you are into the project to um, so, some uh, some projects, for example, in the second season, everything is already kind of thought out. So it, it makes it a lot quicker because this is what a tree looks like here. This is what a car looks like. You're not figuring it out. So it, you just execute. So it makes it a lot quicker and easier um, because those problems were already solved. Uh, but depending on some shows, some shows you'll get notes, not just from your art director, but the showrunner and also like uh, different departments. Like right now we, we're getting notes from Marvel and also consumer products. And, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a ton of people, but it's, it's part of the process and it's okay because everybody adds a little bit to it and you learn something from it. You know, there's moments that are frustrating like anything else because you do feel like pretty strongly about your design and sometimes you get notes that you don't agree with. But again, you're there. If you're drawing on your own time and it's your own drawing, like it's okay to, to be that. But if you are on somebody else's dime, you're there to solve a problem. And the problem is design. And the problem is how do we get this drawing? And you're higher there to make the drawing look the best that it can to the design of the person in charge. So that it's a balancing act. We'll say. So Kim has another question, and this is pretty relevant to him. Um, it's a career question. How did you get from Argentina to LA? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I came here because my uncle was working here and I was able to get an airplane ticket and I came and I lived pretty roughly for a long time uh, and I did any job that I could do at the time. That's why I worked at a bank for a long time because it was the best job I could get being a, a foreigner and then that allowed me to pay for a lot of things that I needed to pay at the time and allow me to provide for my family. And then, um, and then it just kind of, I just always just worked hard, I guess. And I just kept going. Um, I was able to have one of my family members um, do the, work to us for my residency. But then I have friends that, for example, have the studios themselves uh, sponsor them. Uh, and they work for that studio and they have a deal and they go from there. But it was rough at the beginning there, especially not speaking English when I got here. It was very rough. Um, I lived on people's couches for a while. Oh, wow. And, uh, and I worked two to three jobs. But, you know, you just have a goal and you keep at it. Seems like it was worth it, too. Yeah, man. It, you know, and like, you know, as much as we get frustrated with the U.S. and what's happening here and all that stuff, 
there's I don't I don't think that being a foreigner in my own country I would have been able to achieve the things that I have achieved here. Um, so you know, not to say that I haven't encountered some resistance in certain places, but that's just ignorance. And you can be mad about it or move forward. The work and your abilities will speak for you. You know, and I haven't really found how many negatives in the industry. You know, uh, people are pretty good about that. And usually the ones that you do find, you kind of stay away from. Or you don't want to work for them again. You know, but I have, I, 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 you know, I've learned that there's always something to learn from every situation. So when you start your backgrounds, do you start always start with a value layer and then color it? Or do you sometimes just go straight with color? I start with value because I like to get all the shapes and designs and everything working because sometimes uh, specifically because uh, a lot of the backgrounds that we do might be at different times of day or we might try to put a different mood to it. And um, it, I feel that for whoever, especially if you're putting it in front of executives that don't have an art background, uh, it makes it clear to them what they're looking at. And it eliminates that whole like, oh, uh, that's a beautiful morning or something like that. And it gets them straight into looking at like, okay, we're drawing a tree now. So <clears throat> what, uh, what do I want this tree to be and the shapes of the tree? So then, and then we can add all that other stuff to it. We got a question in the chat. Um, how do you set the mood while painting the background? Mm, what do you mean? I don't understand the question. Like the mood for the scene. By reading the script? Like it's a dark scene, you use dark colors and... Right, uh, yes, exactly, yes, yes. Uh, um, what are we trying to say? So then we, you start doing like little color comps, like little little, little squares of color. Um, they might have, not, you not might, you, you, you distill the background into like, it's more basic shapes. And then you do colors and you push them back and forth until you find uh, a color composition that is saying exactly and it will create in the feel that you want that to convey and then you move from there because you know it, the 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 image can be used like we said for different things like for example like you could be going into this forest and it's daytime and you're going like la 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 and you're just walking in and then all of a sudden um, something horrible happens or it's about to happen and so you start changing the colors of the background to allow the storytelling to come through. So just, just as much as music, you know, music is very powerful. And usually you can see in a, in a cartoon where music is coming through, how um, the colors sometimes change as well when the music comes in and it changes the mood. What's the best way for somebody to get, uh, for beginners to study color theory? I would say find masterful work, do maybe a copy or two, and then put it away and do your own interpretation. Uh, like allowing yourself to understand their problem solving and how they arrive to those solutions. And then, um, then putting that away. So I had a teacher in art center that, um, I shouldn't say art center, but I don't need to name drop. But uh, I had a teacher that what he said was, your own style comes from everything that you forget from the, the master you're looking at, and then you fill it up with your own voice. So there's, you know, 
um, I will say, so a, a good exercise would be to find somebody that you really like, um, maybe try to imitate their work to the point of polished and then put it away and do your own thing. Yeah. When you get a mental block during your design period, how do you push through that mental block? Oh, I'm very, <laughs> so um, I'm super stubborn. So I'll sit there until I, and I'll keep drawing until, until I get something. Um, it's just the way I work. Um, it is okay to maybe put it away and work on something else for a time. And, um, and then coming back to that piece. Uh, even work that I have done, sometimes I'll like, I'll finish it. And before I turn it in, I'll look at it and um, try to see if there's ways to make it better. Because you always, I, I don't, especially on TV, you're never truly done. You just ran out of time. <laughs> and that's, that's where you at. And so I, I, I like the schedule of TV because of that. Well, a couple last few questions before we wrap this up. Here's one from a, from a student who's just starting animation school. What's your advice for students who are just starting? Um, my advice. Well, make the program, the student, the, the program, whatever school you're at, make it work for you. Uh, sometimes these programs, they'll, they'll tell you, you need to take this class, you need to take that class. I will strongly advise to research the teachers and see which ones uh, are stronger. Uh, you know, you might have teachers that are stronger than others. And also they might help you more to achieve what you're trying to achieve. So you need to figure out what you want from the program. Um, specifically for art school, art school is so expensive. I, I don't, I think it's okay to like, you know, um, go and experiment a little bit and see other things that might influence because art, you know, science might help you and things like that. But it's specifically if you're going to art school to have a, like achieve something in a specific, I will say have that program work for you. Figure it out, figure out which teachers will make you stronger and also your peers. Your peers, I learn more from my peers than some of my teachers, to be honest with you. Um, and I still talk to some of my teachers and I still, cause I, I'll get to the point specifically if you go to a school where your teachers are also working in the industry that you, you'll be peers, like you'll be working with them. Like just, it, it's all about like time and mileage, how much time you have spent, you know? And a lot of teachers are professionals that want to give back a little bit, you know. But yeah, make the program work for you, man. Make those bucks, those dollars work for you. Nobody's going to give it to you. You need to go get it. Nobody's going to, after you graduate, nobody's going to give you a job. They might, but you need to go get it, you know. Like, you know, some people are very talented and they get work. Some people have to work a little bit harder. I am not necessarily the most gifted out of my class, but I have never had hiatus since I graduated. I have always worked consistently. And that has to do with my work ethic, I believe. So, yeah. That's some solid advice. Um, so how much of a boost did you get by going to art school and finding your career? Was it really helpful to you or it just set you in the right direction? Art school taught me more how to learn than what they were teaching me in the school. Um, it, 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 ta it, it taught me how to think in a different way and how to approach the work. And also like, it, it was the first time that I was surrounded by other artists 
and you don't realize how much there's a different way of seeing the world and thinking when you're around other artists. It's quite interesting. Um, Cause I thought I was the weird guy most of my life. And then I realized that well, I'm not as weird as I thought. And weird is good. Weird is cool. Weird is because you see the world through a different lens. And that's actually a very powerful, very powerful tool. There's a little tree. Sorry again. <laughs> it's a beautiful tree. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. But yeah. So before um, we wrap this up, do you have any final words of wisdom for the attendees? Um, don't be scared to fail. Um, work will never, there's not, there's not a, there's not a secret or a, a technique or something that I can give you that will make you better. Um, the thing that makes you better is practice, practice, practice and work and um, just keeping at it. Um, if, if you don't find it to, I mean, I draw every day and I still like look forward to it. Like I get up and I have this new idea and I, I, I just go at it and I draw. Um, and also like other people that you admire, you know, talking to them and reaching out to them and understanding and uh, talking to them and see what inspires them as well as like live a little bit too, like outside of art and drawing, like go do things because that actually influences and makes your art better. Um, you have to be pulling out of this, um, you know, treasure trove of uh, ideas. And if you're not in the world doing things, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have things to pull out of. So, you know, but practice. Yeah, you gotta find inspiration. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also, um, if you're blocked, uh, just do. Uh, don't don't get discouraged. Just start drawing something else, you know, and then come back to it. And uh, draw, by drawing something else, your mind is doing something else. I I have so many times that I find a solution when I'm doing something completely different, you know, and it clicks my mind. Yeah. So I'm going to share a screen for the cartoon crunch. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your experience with mentoring the, the animators for that project? Oh, uh, you know, it was, um, it was a cool experience. It, it, I really like to see everybody's work and also to communicate that, um, that there was no, like, I, I, the, the only difference between them and me at that specific point was just experience uh, or, or just that I've been doing it a little bit longer and that's it. Uh, I was exactly where they were at and it was really exciting to see their work and their, um, their, the way that they problem solve. And, um, I'm, and it makes me excited about work because then I like, they were telling me the story of what they were trying to do and I was like, that's cool. And what if we do this? And what if we do that? And then they, they got excited. And then it, it, it was uh, a back and forth. And that felt a lot like uh, work, uh, like not work in the sense of like, oh, it's work, but like how, how we work at, at Disney or different studios. Uh, it's a collaborative back and forth. That's cool. Yeah, it's been a fun project so far. Um, we've got the final animations from from the the animators too, and they turned out really great. Yeah, they're doing really good work, man. So it's, it's really nice, and it's a really strong like statement mm -hmm. for anybody looking to hire somebody. You know? Yeah, yeah, this would be great on their portfolios. Yeah, they're gonna show the final animations on the twenty sixth. So yeah, because be it's fun. not just the animation; it's also like they're working in a group. Yeah. So it's that collaborative like you can work with other artists yeah it's important yeah i think they got a lot from that experience well i think that's it for this webinar um thank you for joining us
this is fun. Sorry about the problems, but I'm glad we got through it. It's okay, man. <laughs> no, it, it just it just happens. It's, it's like everything. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's like our career. You, you know, shit happens all the time. You oh, just yeah. roll with the punches and you keep going. Constantly. Well, anything else you'd like to add before I shut this down? Um, keep going, keep going, keep growing, keep doing things to inspire you. Keep looking and asking questions. Ask questions, man. E don't be afraid of emailing the artists you look up to. Um, yeah, we had, a, uh, yeah. we had a question from someone that wanted to send their portfolio to you on Instagram, so you might get some DMs soon. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'd love to see that. If you guys have work that you would like me to see, and I can give you a little notes here and there. It'd be amazing. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks for offering the help. All right, well, that's a wrap. It's lunchtime. Yeah, man. All right, we'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.